start. So my name is Alex, and this presentation is how MySQL server, the database server, can attack you. All right. So um, again, my name is Alex. My background is working with databases, open source databases. I have been working with uh, MySQL database for 18 years or so. And I started with um, MySQL AB, the company behind MySQL. It's a Swedish company. I worked as an architect there. And um, about four years ago, I joined Amazon Web Services working on relational database in, um, database as a service as a database engineer and uh, security was offensive security was my hobby for some time uh, I uh, started playing uh, CTFs and uh, at uh, AWS I created a new team offensive security team we call it red team obviously so I'm currently leading this team. So this talk will be pretty much describing this scenario. And we will actually do this together today. So imagine that you have been hacked. Your web service, web server, was hacked. And this site is powered by MySQL database. So your MySQL database has been hacked as well. So now you need to restore everything. There was nothing important really on this website. It, let's imagine that it was WordPress, right? So now you need to restore from the backup. You have a backup. You connect to the MySQL. But now this guy, the bad guy, has control over your MySQL server, and now this guy has control over your workstation where you connected to MySQL. So how it is even possible? Let's uh, take a look, and I will explain a lot of things about MySQL, and uh, we will actually I will show you the <laughs> demo how this is gonna work. So this is our agenda. So we, there is a, there was a remote code execution in MySQL because of MySQL protocol. It was silently fixed in 2019 after the finding. And then in 2023, about a year ago, uh, my team, me and my colleague Martin, uh, have been doing MySQL security research and we found a bypass to the fix. So we had uh, filed a CVE with uh, Oracle MySQL and it was fixed um, around April last year. So I will uh, do the demo of the old issue and we'll show you the tool that can do that. And we'll also uh, I will also show the demo for the bypass. So, to really understand how it works, we need to understand MySQL protocol. MySQL uses the binary protocol, and it was created a long time ago. So, let's imagine our MySQL client connects to the server. And what will happen first is MySQL will say, hello, MySQL server. I want to authenticate. And I have a username and password. And I will use the plugin, the MySQL native password plugin. So MySQL supports flexible plugins or methods to do authentication. You can actually write your own authentication plugin. You can support different methods. You can use LDAP or you can write your own. So the client will say, I will use this plugin so that the server will understand how to deal with my password hash. And the server will say, very good. 
let's use this MySQL native password plugin. I loaded this plugin and I checked your username and password and you're good to go. Now let's imagine another scenario. Right, we have the MySQL client again and the My MySQL client is using its own implementation of MySQL authentication plugin. So it says, I will use whatever plugin, whatever plugin name. And the server said, nah, I don't know what this is. But let's use another plugin. And the client says, okay, I'll try to load this plugin if I have that. So what does it really mean? And we can look at the code. MySQL is open source database. So we can look, look at the code. We need client part of the code. So again, MySQL server can tell the client what plugin to load. And MySQL client try to load it. So what does load actually mean? Plugin is a shared library. And load means deal open call or load library call on Windows. So that's me looking at this code for the first time. I was thinking, well, this is a security issue here. So let's look at this code, the actual code, and see what it's doing. So if we will look down there, and this is client plugin CC in MySQL 8. Right? This is old version. If we start with line 439 here, we will see that it will do deal open call. So plugin is a shared library on Linux will do deal open. But if we look up to line 435, we'll actually see that it will prepare a string. And the string will concatenate three things. The name, the plugin name, that comes from where? From the server or from the client, right? So the plugin name comes from the server. And then there is a plugin dir, which is dedicated directory for the plugin. This is where the client will try to find the files, the shared library. And then it will also concatenate the extension. On Linux it's SO, on Windows it's DLO. Right? So what protects us here? The only thing that protects us here is this plugin here. Otherwise, we specify the name, it can load the plugin from arbitrary place on the client side. But what if we'll do a simple directory traversal? Will it work? So, actually, if this will work, that means an arbitrary code execution, pretty much, right? We can load a shared library anywhere on the machine. So, it actually worked before it was fixed in 2019. It has been there for a very long time, actually. So, it was uh, found and filed as a Hacker One report against MariaDB. MariaDB is uh, another implementation. We used to call it Fork, but they don't uh, think there is a fork of MySQL. It was created by the founder of MySQL, Monty. So it was um, filed against MariaDB, and MariaDB fixed that in 2019. So this report actually explains that very well. So now MariaDB fixed that, accepted and fixed that, and uh, fixed that with different versions of the client and server, right? What is interesting about this, this is a shared code, but it really makes sense only in the client, on the client side. So we can look at the fix, and the fix pretty much 
sanitize the input. Again, what client and server communicates is the plugin name. The name of the plugin should never contain all this stuff, right? So this is the right thing to do. Then it will also fix was pushed to MySQL community server, which is currently owned by Oracle. And it was also fixed. MySQL server owned by Oracle receives CVEs, but they don't disclose the, the actual CVE descriptions. Uh, you can actually search an open source MySQL code on GitHub, and you can search for the commits and commit texts. Texts are very helpful, actually. So this is a non-public bug. And if you search for this commit, it will explain what it does. Right? So that's the same problem that we have been discussing for a long time. All right, so it has been fixed. And the fix is pretty much sanitizing the input. You can notice that this fix is different from MariaDB. On the MariaDB side, it will just remove the characters. This thing is actually searching for a separate. Separate is different on Linux and Windows. Right? Slash, backslash. And then it will give me no paths allowed for shared libraries. All right. So this is the quick summary of the directory traversal. As the server can push the full path of the shared library as a plugin name to the client. And the client can actually load it. And malicious code can be executed on the client side. It fixed in MariaDB and MySQL in 2019. If you haven't upgraded your client, and client is libraries, common client client, GUI tools like MySQL Workbench, you need to do it right now. All right, so let's actually do that. What we'll do is we will actually hack the MySQL database administrative workstation. Let's see how does it work in reality. So we have the server that we control. We need to have the server that we control. We need to have the client to be the old version. And the database administrator or whoever will need to connect using the MySQL command line tools or GUI tools or something. MySQL Workbench is a popular GUI tool uh, supported by MySQL community. So what do we need to actually perform this attack? So again, we need control of the MySQL or MariaDB server. Any version, doesn't matter. Then uh, we will need to have the client old vulnerable version. And we will also need the ability to push the code as a shared library. Okay? That sounds complicated? That's, let's do it. So the first thing we need to do is we need to write a rogue server. Because by default, you cannot set it up so that it will push the plugin name containing all that stuff. So there are a couple ways of doing that. We can take the open source MySQL server and we can write a plugin. And the second way is we can completely remove, we can, if we control the server, right, we can shut down MySQL and start something on the same port which will be pretending to be MySQL. So it's a fake server, it's a rogue server. 
So I found a very good implementation of the MySQL protocol written in Python. So this is our plan of attack. We need to write a rock server with the ability to push the plugin name. We will be loading arbitrary code as shared library, and then we'll push this exploit to the database administrator machine. Step one, rogue server. We can use the Python implementation of the MySQL protocol. It's really simple. There is a, a software, the library called MySQL Mimic. And this MySQL Mimic, you can just do pip install MySQL Mimic, that's it. And then you do from MySQL Mimic, you can import something. And then you can extend it by creating a custom identity provider. And inside of that custom identity provider, you can specify the plugin name. And then there is no restrictions. So this is a simple small program that acts as rogue server. The only thing that I'm doing here, apart from using the MySQL Mimic, is creating this class. And I have uh, this main program, which actually takes two arguments. The first is the plugin name, which will contain my directory traversal string and the port. So then I will start that server listening on the standard MySQL port 3306, replacing our normal MySQL server. And then let's test it out. For this test, I used ODBC driver. ODBC is driver for MySQL. It works on Windows, on Mac, on Linux. It uses MySQL client libraries. Everything that uses MySQL client libraries will be vulnerable. So now I simply connect using this, and I can see that this is client, this is old client, old driver, and then I can see that it was indeed tried to load the plugin. There's obviously no such file there, but I passed the AAA, right? And I can see that it was trying to load this AAA.so with directory traversal. So our injection has worked. Number one done. Step number two, we need actually to have the arbitrary code injected into our shared library. So how do we actually load the exploit code? So I was first, I was actually trying to write the normal valid MySQL plugin. And then I realized I don't need this. In on Linux specifically, whatever you put into init will be called, will be executed. So I created this simple how many lines, I don't know, six, seven, eight lines code. And what I'm doing here inside of the init, I will be creating a file on disk on Linux, and then or on Mac. And then here I will be opening a calculator on my laptop. Right? So, and then I compile it normally with GCC, and that's it. So, what will happen if I will load that as a plugin in MySQL? The client will complain because it will not find the symbols that it's looking for, but it doesn't matter because my init already work. Another thing that will be nice is to remove that SO extension. I want to actually not only load 
the shared library for arbitrary location. But I can also want to load something else. Right? So let's take a look at this code. This is actually maybe the oldest code still in MySQL. This is written by Richard O'Keefe in 1984. Right? And it's a it's a string move. And it actually have a length overflow. So if we control the name of this plugin, and then we know that the max length is 512. If we will exceed that length, what will happen? The SO part will be moved off and cut off. So that means that we can prepare the crafted string as our plugin name and MySQL client will try to load a really arbitrary file without appending the SO at the end. All right, so then um, how do we overflow that? We need to calculate. We need to calculate precisely the name of the plugin, our string, so that it will be cut off specifically to the point where this SO extension will be removed. So I calculated this uh, function. I created this function in uh, Python. Don't judge me on Python code, this is ugly. Um, and uh, this code actually used it. <coughs> Sorry. it used this traverse string. And what we, it will do is it will use this traverse string and it will append backslash like slashes, right? to that string. In Linux, it doesn't matter how many slashes, how many of these symbols in there. It's still valid. So, I will calculate the number of slashes and concatenate and create this large string specifically to do the length overflow. Alright? So then, in the Start Rogue Server, I will call that function, I'll take my plugin name, and I will calculate the string needed to overflow the buffer. Then I have that, and then I can actually disguise my shared library as anything. I can put a picture. So let's try it out. I created a shared library and I put it on the TMP. It's pwn.png. It's a picture, right? But then I start my server and I connect my MySQL client to that. And I can see this. So it cut off. It also cut off the error text, as we can see. And to actually verify, I use the S trace. And on the S trace, I can see that it was indeed opening that file. And then the next thing it will do, it will do deal open on that file. This is how I verify that my injection is, has worked. And this is how I verify that the, the calculations are correct. Right? So now, the last step is we need to somehow push this exploit code because I don't control your machine, right? I need to have something on your machine. So we can do uh, social engineering. We can find a victim on LinkedIn and send them a resume. If you receive a resume in PDF format, what would you do? You probably save it somewhere on your computer. You don't need to open it. 
You just need to have it somewhere on your machine. If you open it, it doesn't will not do anything actually. Right? So if I send you the resume, you will save it, and now I know that you will save it, and then I can exploit it. So let's look at the demo. I have the recorded demo here, and uh, here's what I have. I have two machines. I have my virtual box environment where I simulate that I have control over my SQL server. And then on my machine, I have this uh, shared library. I compile the shared library and I disguise it as resume. Let's imagine that my colleague Martin has sent me the resume. Let's see how it works. All right, so this is the actual code and it will open the calculator. And this is the file, the PDF file. It's not a PDF, it's a shared library with my exploit. So now I start my server on port 307. Right? It will send this. I somehow know that this victim, me, loaded it, saved it, so now this is my SQL 8.0 workbench, 8.0.13, it's very old, don't use it. And then I simply connect to this database, my hacked database. I have my plugin uh, configured here. So now, let's see what will happen. I start to connect, uh, calculate it here. Right? This means that my hack actually worked. So now, we actually control the database administrator of wherever workstation, laptop, Mac, book, laptop, or any laptop by this. Right? So you can also see that the workbench produces an error. Because it's not a valid plugin. It cannot authenticate. It's not a valid plugin. We can also make it a valid plugin if we want to disguise it, really. But we don't have to. The code has run. Right? So the Windows demo, I probably skip the Windows demo, it's the same thing. Uh, it's, uh, it will uh, have a DLL, right? And then it will create a message box on it. Actually, you can go through this. <laughs> Real quick. Right, so again I connect uh, using an old version uh, and uh, can see the process list and then I got it and we can see it is point. All right, so now the new discovery. We have been doing MySQL research and uh, we have discovered a new security issue in February 2023. Actually, we discovered a bypass to 2019 fix. If you have a bypass to the, the sanitization stream, that means that we are vulnerable to it. And then we reported it to Oracle and uh, Oracle in on April, Oracle fixed it in the latest versions at that time, 8033.57. MariaDB was not affected, but Oracle MySQL was. This is the description. I'll go through that later. So what is the problem? The problem, again, is this oversimplified sanitization. So let's take a look at this um, code, line number 445. What do we see here? We see that it is comparing a string 
and try to find the directory separate slash or backslash. But we also see this CS. What CS is? It's a character set. So MySQL actually supports a number of character sets, including UTF-8. And you remember the date of the old code in MySQL? 1984 predates the use of UTF-8. But UTF-8 works this way. If we have a Latin chapter, it's one byte. If it's non Latin chapter, depending upon the, the chapter set table, it can be two bytes or three bytes or four bytes. I, yeah, I don't remember UTF-8 actually. Supports eight bytes, but four bytes. But then we have another check set called UTF-16. UTF-16 is always multi-byte. So imagine if we will be using UTF-16, what will happen? It will skip over. Our string is ASCII bytes. And then I will compare that against the real chapter set. So the issue is super simple. If you provide the MySQL client, if you configure the MySQL client with UTF-16, this fix is useless because it will be skipping over two bytes at a time. So, the newer workbench, the newer at the time of the fix, right, 8019 plus, actually have this configuration option, non-standard, but nevertheless, the valid configuration option for opt charter set name. And you can change it to UTF-16. So then, in this case, what will happen, I'll do the demo again. UTF-16, test connection, calculator. How does it work? We actually, it actually did the correct thing. It will skip over the, ch the, the check. So this is the discovery that we found. And um, this is the example of the MySQL common line. Uh, client. I hope you will see that as a black uh, background. So we have this is on Windows. We have this DLL here, and we'll try to load this DLL with a with a new version with a with a new discovery pipette. So this is the version. 32, it's after the first fix, but before the second fix, right? And then if we just connect, it will say no paths allowed. But if we will provide the additional parameter, default check the set, UTF-16, then it will be pawned. All right, so now it's fixed in the latest MySQL version at the time of writing. So this is uh, uh, to prove that it has been actually fixed. So 8033 client or server as well. All right, so we connect to the rogue server again. And then it says no paths allowed. Uh, because 2019 fix is there, and I'll do default chair to set equals UTF 16. Now it says the UTF 16 chair to set is not allowed. So Oracle did a shortcut and actually will fix. The issue by disallowing the UTF-16, which they considered 
to be not supported for the, for the client. So that's very interesting, right? In the future, maybe MySQL or Oracle will forget about this and, and start supporting it. Have an opportunity in the future. I don't think we'll have, but. So this is very interesting. So the Oracle has fixed that. And uh, this concludes our attack scenario. That concludes our demo. So this is what we did. We wrote a rogue server in uh, Python. We replaced the MySQL server with a rogue server. We loaded an arbitrary file name, a resume, which is actually a shared library. We disguised our exploit as a resume. And uh, we managed to push the exploit code to the database administrator machine or whoever connects to the MySQL server. So the MySQL server actually attacks you. Finally, quickly, versions affected. 2019 original. Um, all the versions, if you're using versions older than 2019, applies to MySQL, MariaDB, Performance Affect, every fork of MySQL actually affected. 2023 only affects the MySQL Percona Server, uh, another fork. That's a UTF-16 character, using UTF-16 character to bypass the fix. And uh, the fix is actually released uh, a year ago. Now, which clients are affected? Only the clients that are based on the C, C++ code. The libraries that they ship as a part of the community server or commercial server. All right, so everything based, if you have a GUI to Workbench or whatever uh, you're using, uh, it's based on libmysql, connector, ODBC driver, everything. It is a good. The GTBC or native implementation, um, native implementation in Go, the native implementation in other languages, those are not affected. Right, so summary. Uh, rogue server can attack client, the, the RC. The, we actually found a bypass to the old issue, and it has been fixed. So, the takeaways. <laughs> if you are using an old code, for example, if you are using a C function written in 1982 or 1984, you need to look at it. Right? You need to look at the code that is using it to make sure that it actually supports the UTF chapter set. And uh, multiply unsafe stream comparison is dangerous and always update. If you're using an old GUI tool uh, that is based on the C library, any GUI tool, old GUI tool, right? Or client to you, you need to update. So that's it. Uh, five minutes left. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm good in time. All right, thank you very much. Uh, questions? Yes. Correct. So, so the question was that the, you you rely on the path on where the resume is saved. Yes, but I have some information, right? So I I may know what machine what machine this database administrator is using or this person is using, right? And I can guess probably if it's Windows. Where it I also control the name, right? I know the name. Maybe this person will 
use a non-standard path, I can also brute force some, right? Um, but if uh, this person will has renamed my, uh, you know, my uh, CV, my resume, right, then out of line. There may be other options there, but it's great. Yeah? So you were referring to, let me find it again, uh, sorry, that was in, uh, ah, that was before that, okay, give me one second. Yeah, yeah, so slash, backslash, so encoded somehow, right, in uh, uh, using what? The, the thing is that that doesn't actually specify, it doesn't check against the check to set. Right, it is just take the name, the ASCII name, and verify this ASCII doesn't have this, this bytes, right? It's bad byte comparison, byte by byte. So if we will encode it something, then the question is where will it be decoded? Right? So I actually looked at the code, it's 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 actually a good idea. Um I will probably look again, but my first pass on this code is that after that, there is a direct deal over. That means that there is no decoding happening between the check and deal over. If there is no decoding happening, then it bites in, checks, deal over. So I don't see how this can actually be Explore that it also checks against the percent, right? M percent, all that, that stuff. And there is no check to set comparison to. So I don't see how this can be. But if you, if you all have the ideas, I'm, I'm really open. We can, together we can find another, another exploit. So that, that's it. Really cool. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So if you, what you're saying is you want to disguise it so that the DBA will not notice that something is off? Yeah, so that they wouldn't notice the, the action fail. Yes. So to do that, uh, you simply take the open source plugin and put the exploit code in, in it. Then this error will not happen there because the real plugin will succeed. And then what you will do is you will basically accept any connection. The problem is that if you're working off the Python, then that is a fake server, there's no, nothing there. So you, what you will do then is, you take the same server that you hacked in, you control the server, and then you take your plugin and you load that plugin into that server. Then this, this our plugin will pretty much do nothing, will accept anything, they will log in, they will see the, the content. So there, that's the way how you disguise this whole thing uh, to the I can achieve what? Oh well, uh, not in the field, but as a simulation. Yes, uh, that's the demo. Yes. So the so the hard part is getting the uh, payload on the 
Yeah, this is uh, something that potentially possible, and the ways how you may want to achieve that, if you somehow tell the client to download the data, right, to save your tables, the content of tables, uh, it is less trivial if you only control the, the server and this is normal client, but there are different client programs that connect to the survey and basically save the files, the content of the table, the backups, right? If you have a backup program that connects to the server, then you can push that and you know, save it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Another option will be to use SSL. And then SSL have the option to save, to basically push the certificate, the client certificate, back to the server can send its own certificate to the client. But no, it doesn't. <laughs> so it will save it in memory. There are, we actually try that and we try to access that it from the PROC file system or or TMPFS, oh, it, did, it, didn't, it didn't work. But it's, it's an in, interesting thing to explore for that. Yeah. All right, thank you very much again.